Oh, good day, everybody, and um, welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, my name's Alyssa, and I'm here with David Carlil. He's a director at DPN and got a lot of experience with uh, helping people to save money. And tonight, I'm really excited because he's going to share some really great tips with us about how to financially recover, a step-by-step -step guide. So it's great that you're joining us. And um, it's going to be fun tonight. I know sometimes you might think finances, how, how boring is that? But when we're saving money and, and um, learning how to build wealth, it's always exciting. Mm -hmm. So, good day, Dave. How are you? I'm very good, Alyssa. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Thank you. I've, um, um, I, this is a virtual background and I've got my kids and my <laughs> husband in the room next to us. And I've given them, uh, like all good parents would, a uh, packet of chocolate biscuits and ask them to not come out <laughs> and not do cartwheels and um, sing songs and dance for the next 30 minutes or so. That's right. Um, but we'll see how we go. Yep. How about you? Oh, look, that's a new norm now, isn't it, for most people? Uh, kids yeah. intro introducing themselves on Zoom and... Um, yes. <laughs> and exactly. uh, and, and it's quite acceptable, I've found. <laughs> but yeah. I've locked mine away just to uh, give us the time alone. <laughs> That's it. And we're glad that you're joining us all tonight. Mm. Uh, I've had a lot of interest in the session this evening. And um, it is what you call an interactive webinar. So um, we're going to get started in just a moment on how to financially recover, a step-by-step -step guide. If you haven't been to one of these webinars before, just quickly, you can actually interact and ask questions as we go. So if you hover over your phone or your laptop, um, you might see a little Q and A button, and you'll also see a chat button. So if you, if you want, you can just jump into that chat button right now and just, just do a shout out, just yell out hello. Um, and we'll say hello back. Um, but during the session, if you want to ask any questions, you can. And at the end, we're going we're gonna to punch through some of those questions. Some of you have sent in questions already. So we'll be talking through and answering those as we go. Um, and I guess one of the other things we're going to do is a little anonymous poll right now. So David is just going to launch a little on anonymous poll. It's another way you can interact tonight. Um, just to get a feel for where everyone's at, it has been an interesting few months. And look, for some of us, we've lost jobs or we've had family members lose jobs or reduce hours and all those sorts of things. So, you know, I know that for some people it has been a very difficult time um, and it's certainly about future-proofing your finances tonight. So you're in the right place. Um, we're going get, to get stuck in and get started. So if you want to jump in there, has 2020 seen significant changes to your short-term plans? Examples, holidays, major purchases, study, job hunting, etc. Yes, no, or not sure. So jump in there and um, cast your vote. It is anonymous and um, we'll sort of see where you're at. So we're going to do a few interactive things as we go along tonight. Um, so Dave, if you want to, you can publish the... Um, can push out the results there and we'll have a look and see how our audience is feeling tonight. Yeah. We've had 88% of people have actually found that yes, wow. it ha yeah. they have seen significant changes and that's no surprise. And 13% have, have not. Um, no one, we've got a very smart audience <laughs> tonight because no that's one awesome. is unsure. No one's not sure. Everybody knows exactly what's going on. So uh, thank you for that, David. Thanks for running that poll. All right. Now, perhaps you can um, flick to the next slide because we are going to look at um, just it wouldn't be a financial presentation tonight if I didn't pop in a disclaimer. And this is just you're all sensible people here, but this is not financial advice. This is a general education, education session. So the information that you're going to hear tonight is not specific to your individual circumstances. So just take that into account. Um, now, Dave, if you can flick to the next slide and we might get started. And maybe if you could start by helping us know where should we start to take control of our finances? Yeah, thank you, Alyssa. Uh, appreciate that. Um, I know uh, these times are a bit uh, difficult for a lot of people, but I think there can be one of the greatest opportunities in life 
um, in taking stock and recalibrating and redirecting your life. Because sometimes we can continue to go through life and never have a, I guess, a wake up call that we are uh, buffeted around by life and, and then get to the end of life and realize we never had enough or never did what we should have done. So I love this quote, this old Chinese proverb. It says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And that also applies to finance. Uh, I always talk to people, I go, when was the best time to invest? 10 years ago. <laughs> When's the best time now? And, and to continue to invest. So um, I think it's a, 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 a true proverb in a sense that we, um, we need to continue to, to look at what we're doing and being aware and, and keep investing. So... Okay. So maybe if you want to start as well, just give us an overview of a little bit about what you're going to cover yep. tonight. Yep. So tonight's a bit of, um, I guess, a reset or financial education, some of the stuff you might know. I've got a bit of a accounting background, financial planning background, mortgage broking. Um, so, but what I was taught in schools is very different to what is in reality mm. and um, understanding and giving you some financial education and the language that goes around that and making it very simple for every day-to-day -day person. So the first key is we've got to look at becoming aware and tonight's becoming aware of your financial position and then what you can do to actually transform um, your life. And mm. so uh, some of the key um, financial literacy is understanding the difference between income and expenditure and then we also look at what an asset and liability, because the traditional of what we're taught as assets and liabilities is actually incorrect. Um, then I'm going to sh share some tools of eliminating waste and improving your cash flow, mm -hmm. and then um, help you understand how to create a, ma a crisis management plan um, in case of life changes. And I had to do this, and I remember going through the GFC um, yep. and, and develop for myself personally my crisis management plan, what if I lost my job and I was in financial services? And I did. And I worked out a strategy to get out of that, which I can use to help day-to-day -day people. Yeah. That's great, Dave. Sounds like it's going to be very, very useful. Now, the next slide is titled Budget, Budget, Budget. Well, I've got to be honest with you. I am a bit of a lazy budgeter and I don't really like budgeting. Yeah. So perhaps you can help <laughs> people like me out there that you know, maybe give them a bit of high level insight as to why you should budget and what it can do for you. Um, and yeah, take it away, Dave. Sure. Um, I understand a lot of people don't like budgeting. It's actually one of the best tools I know to um, bring freedom yeah. in your finances. And whether you're rich or poor, um, I know the rich budget because they all budgeting is being aware of how much comes in and where it goes. It's like having a roadmap. And um, you know, when you drive a car, um, you put your destination in the GPS and you know where you're gonna to get to. It's the same thing with a budget. If you, if you don't have a roadmap, you'll always be um, controlled by life circumstances. So I've divided probably three levels of budget. And um, the first one is budget to live. This is really the person that's getting a dollar in and spending a dollar. They're just, everything they earn, they end up spending. And that's generally most people or people without budgets uh, are always seem to, you might have friends or, or know someone that they're always seem to scrimp and scrape to just survive the week of the month. We want to move from being um, hand to mouth in, in our employment. Then the next level of budget is budgeting to get rid of debt or eliminating un unnecessary expenses. I realize most people have more money than they think. It's just that, that they've never really um, stopped and looked at what they have. So I have eliminating, eliminating um, debt is a very key um, tool to actually build your financial freedom as well. Because most people spend their whole life buying debts and paying it off for the rest of their life. So we, we want to learn to pay down debts. And I have a simple methodology for that. It's called a waterfall technique. So if you've got car loans, credit cards, um, you know, pay the minimum debt on each credit card, then focus on one personal debt and add extra payments. Once you've paid that off, then take those extra payments and go after the next debt because debts will, will be your enemy of your future. So we want to really, really attack that and free up your cash flow, which is the next level of budgeting. So that, this level of budgeting is um, really directing where your money is. So for my felt, myself, I have the income coming in, mm -hmm. then the next line is actually money invested. 
Most people have all their expenses and then what is left over to invest. So as part of a strategic plan or a roadmap is you always should be putting money to invest first and then paying your debts last. So it doesn't mean you don't pay your debts, but you, but, but you always have a strategic understanding of paying, uh, investing money all the time, even when you've got other assets. I like that. That's really good. Um, and actually, it reminds me of a saying on the point two that you're making about that someone said to me once, and that is, we often buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like with money we don't have. <laughs> so if you've fallen into that trap ever, um, this is a little wake up call that you don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And look, even in this time, I've looked around my house. Okay, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that we accumulate and we never use. And I, yeah. I have a saying, use is better than ownership. I'd rather someone else use it, so I sell it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what, Dave? I've actually found um, in the last few months, and I bet some of the people listening have also found, and perhaps they want to jump into the, the chat and, and put their answer as to what they've found is just purely by the situation we're in, staying at home a lot more and, and, and all of that type of thing, um, that there are things that we are saving money on that we may not have expected. So if you found a little tip that you're saving money on, then um, jump into the, the chat there and just say, what is it that you're, you've managed to save money on? Maybe you're not eating lunch out so much, or perhaps, I don't know. But if you've got a handy tip there, we'd love to, we'd love to hear from you. So jump in there and, um, and, and tell us what it is. Um, so one of our people have mentioned fuel. Another person, petrol. So absolutely, and I think that's fantastic. Yes. Certainly um, some memberships and things like that. Definitely savings on transport. Absolutely. It's good to think of all the um, the carbon emissions we're saving too. Takeaway coffees. Yep, yep. absolutely. <laughs> Eating out. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I am. I am actually just next to me. I'm sitting at my dining room table, although I'm in a virtual room here. You can't see my messy table. But I have, you won't be able to see this, but I'm, I've got my little trusty supermarket menu item book yeah. and I'm cooking up recipes there. I'm not the best cook, but I'm getting better and saving money at the same time. Eating out, yes, great, mm. fantastic. Keep those comments coming. Dave, I'm gonna hand back to you there. Yeah. You're gonna talk about assets and liabilities. Absolutely. And look, what we've saved on as well, my wife started gardening and planted zucchinis. So we've had over $200 yeah, worth great. of zucchinis in the last- Wow, she wins. <laughs> And just been um, giving it to people. So. Yeah, well, one of our panelists, uh, one of our um, listeners here has put drinks with the girls, make cocktails at home instead. I can tell you, you, you hope that you're sitting there enjoying a cocktail because that's the one thing I'm missing. I've got the, the heater going, the fireplace is on, and um, it's definitely that cold sort of night, isn't it? Great yeah, night for a, a homemade cocktail. Absolutely. So right. let, let me tell you, again, I studied accounting and what I was taught you had an asset column and you had a liability column mm -hmm. in, your, in, 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 um, in your financial. And um, the way I was, re what I had to relearn was a liability is something that takes money out of your pocket and an asset is something that puts money in your pocket. So naturally when I talk to clients these days or customers or friends or family, I go, is your house an asset or a liability? Yeah. And um, before I tell them the definition of this, and most people, it, they start to think, okay, is an asset or a liability? Is this a trick question? And most people generally say it's an asset. Mm. But then I go, even if you had it paid off, is it an asset? Because you still got to pay the rates and the maintenance. Mm -hmm. It's actually a liability because you have to go to work and pay for those expenses. To the bank, your mortgage is an asset to them. So it is an asset because it has value, but it's not an income producing asset. So what we want to do is shift the mindset from buying liabilities and delay our gratification. Because again, most people would have on their asset liability column, their car is an asset, but you have to go to work and you're trapped day to day to go get the money to pay for the petrol and the expenses and the insurance. So there needs to be a mindset shift of what an asset is. And simply an asset is something that produces an income that pays for your life, whether you're working or not. Again, one of the other key questions I ask customers, I go, if you stop working today, how long would you survive? Mm. And this has become more apparent in today's um, current nature is, okay, some people, their greatest asset is their job because mm -hmm. that's where they produce income. But what we want to do is shift away and actually generate assets that generate income to pay for our life, whether we're working or not. 
And this is the shift that we need to, um, to take control of our future. Um, there's another saying I like to have, I go, the rich fear losing, oh no, fear, the rich, yeah, the rich fear losing and the poor fear not having. So the real fear in finances, the, the real question in finance is learning to deal with fear. So budgeting helps take control of that. And what we want to do is take control of our um, financial health is actually realize where we are and where we need to get to and how we're going to get to. People can do more than what they, what they think they can, it's mm -hmm. just they've never been taught how to do it. So what we do today will impact our future. So yeah. are we buying liabilities or are we buying assets? Um, yeah, and I think that's that mind shift, isn't it? It's just if you're thinking about spending that money all the time and just making ends meet and not putting aside some money to invest, it's going to be very hard to get ahead. Yep. And absolutely, I, I like what you're saying about, let's think about what type of assets we need to produce an income. Yep. Absolutely. And look, I, I, I'm one to enjoy life and to buy nice things. And I, and I spend money on the right things hmm. to enjoy. So it's not about not doing anything. It's about... Yep knowing where your money is going. If you're, un, if you're un, unaware of where your money is going, it's hard to direct it mm. and, and actually invest in the right things. So the first thing I, I usually suggest is reduce or eliminate liabilities, increase your asset base. Mm -hmm. So again, you might have boat loans, car loans, it might be Netflix. <laughs> so that's a cost each month. It, it, get rid of Netflix and read financial books <laughs> or read, it, pick up some old traditions and um, you know, we have multiple subscriptions. We could probably, and, and sometimes we don't even know because they're just direct debit and they're coming out. Mm. People have got money. I have a, um, another saying that it's called eat your house principle. So mm. say if you had a, an investment, say if investment property cost you $50 a week to hold, that's less than $10 a day in a work week. Most people spend more than that on their lunch mm. and, 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 and so forth never make room for investing. And I go, you've just eaten your, your investment property, your house. It's as simple as that. It's learning to allocate money. So what we want to do is re eliminate any liabilities that we don't need in our life, um, any extra liabilities that we can do without. And you might find your life freed up, but then we want to direct that money back into an asset base. So we want to look at um, saving money now and then redirecting it into wealth income producing assets. And then the next level is learning to leverage to invest. So what that means is you can't really save up as fast as inflation and tax. So, you know, a lot of people struggle saving up for a deposit for a house. Um, there are techniques where you can use family equity instead of being able to save up. You might have great income or, or you thought you have to save 10, 20%, but we can actually leverage against existing property or family's property to get in now and, and also get into the market. And or if you've got an existing home, you might have value to um, leverage to get into that property. Again, my parents, um, they came from a third world country <laughs> and um, that they were taught, you know, buy a house, buy a car, pay it off for the rest of their life. And they mm. had their house paid off back in 1980, Alyssa. Mm. You know? And they only paid 80,000 back then. Mm -hmm. When they retired, all they had was their house and they sold their coffee shop and $100,000. They still needed the pension. What they, if they were taught or they, they go, we wish we knew what you knew back then. Yeah. You know, they could have used the equity, bought the house next door and had an income for life. Yeah. yeah. It's not an uncommon story, Dave. And I think part of it is just knowing. It's not difficult, mm. but part of it is getting prepared and allowing yourself time to, to build wealth. So, you know, you're absolutely right. You've mentioned that money skills are not taught in school. Mm. Um, take us through what do the rich know? Yeah, look, this is a passion of mine. And because um, uh, again, I wasn't taught at home um, how to build wealth or I was taught get a good, get good grades, yep. get a good job, mm -hmm. work, buy a house, buy a car and pay it off for the rest of your life. Yep. And just paying a house off never builds your wealth. So it's not that I have a good debt system, G-O-O-D, get out of debt. Mm -hmm. And there's structures of, of doing that um, that I teach customers as well. Um, but you have to get a financial mindset. You have to create an investment mindset. You have to allocate and think, I need to work out how to get that little bit extra and start directing it into income. So, mm -hmm. the, so one of these principles is called pay yourself first. So simply, let me explain it like this. If I gave you a basket of 10 eggs and each week I gave you a basket of 10 eggs and I said, you can use nine eggs, okay? Mm -hmm. 
and but leave the extra egg in the basket. What happens after 10 weeks? 10 weeks. You got an extra 10 eggs. You got 20 eggs. You got one week of work or one week's wages where you didn't have to work. But if that is also invested, now you're making an income on that week's wage. So this is called pay yourself first. So instead of going to work, excuse me, instead of going to work every day and, 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 and you're working to pay your liabilities, what you want to do is now get assets to pay for your liabilities. So you're not just putting a little bit of money aside, but if you're investing that, you're also getting that return. So you're getting not only your 10 eggs, yep. your pay packet, but you're actually getting a little bit more than that because you're Absolutely. investing it in a growth asset. Yep. Um, okay, that sounds good. Hmm. Yeah, look, another great saying that I like, Albert Einstein saying, he, he, he says, um, they asked him what was the greatest force in the universe and he goes, compound interest. So... <laughs> You know, he understood the power of investment. But investment can also mean investing in your financial knowledge. So there's three things you can invest in. Your time, um, uh, your, your, your knowledge, your wealth, and, and then all, also, um, uh, it just slipped my mind, <laughs> um, and your education. Then. <laughs> yeah, so your wealth, your time, sorry, your wealth, your time, and your knowledge, yeah. and, and your investment. So, But the other thing is getting a team of experts. You don't have to know everything. So... Um, you want to pay the right professionals and, and, and again, getting an accountant, good mortgage broker and legal advisor as well. And a property strategist. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if you're looking at investing in the property, yeah. um, it, it's having the right team around you. It um, is important. It yeah. is important. I mean, look, when you think about it, you are the CEO of your own life mm. and you're the, you're, you know, most CEOs are not doing everything in their company. They're actually employing some experts Correct. to help them along the way and to guide them and to get the best advice and things like that. So having that team is absolutely a really good point to build absolutely. those key professionals. Sure. Um, so, yeah, no, thank you, Dave. That's, that's fantastic. Mm. Now, you know, we've just moved to the next slide here. If you, if you can see it on your phone or your, your computer there, um, we're talking about, protecting and passing on wealth. Because look, at the end of the day, um, we don't want to just build all this wealth and then die, do we? We want to actually do something with it. We want to create a legacy. Perhaps we've got a charity that we want to pass it on to. Perhaps we're a parent and want to pass it on to children. Or maybe you're not a parent, but you want to pass it on to a sibling or provide for mm -hmm. other members in the, in the family, the extended family. Um, how do we do that? Because, you know, we, we, we all sort of, as humans, we want to have some kind of ongoing legacy, don't we? We don't just want it to be Absolutely. all for nothing. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Now look, um, part of building wealth, you've got to have a mindset beyond the immediate. Um, like, you know, the budgeting to get out of debt, I usually call that the point of zero. So some people, their whole goal in life is to get out of debt. And once they get out of debt, they don't have a goal past that point of zero. So mm -hmm. they get back into debt to get out of debt for their goal. So even with building wealth, moving past the immediate, so it allows, it's, it's make it a daily habit, make it your family habit, educate your, your children, mm -hmm. teach your children how to build wealth. So I like to get um, my kids' birthday money. Um, they've got plenty of toys and I actually, buy, I actually use it, save it up and then buy allotments of $1,000 worth of shares. So their birthday, Christmas money. And I wanna set them up and teach them the wealth principles young. Um, and even if you give them pocket money, teach them, put away 10%, teach them to invest, put it in the saving. Yep. But wealth should be passed on. Just generationally, generations can be wealthy. So if your parents passed on their house and their mm -hmm. investments to you, and then you pass it on to your children, we can, we can, we can build wealth. And society. so they don't have to live from day to day and, and from hand to mouth. And, mm -hmm. and re-educate yourself and re-educate your system. Uh, your, your, your family and it can be fun and it can be part of part of your language and what you do the day to day so one yeah. is building wealth the next is you've got to protect wealth get insurances and then learning to pass on wealth mm. set your kids up the, the real test of wealth is this is it lasts to the third generation so yeah. the first generation usually builds it second generation usually maintains it and the third generation usually blows it so the real <laughs> test of wealth is how do you educate the next generation to be a builder and yeah. pass her on as well. So. And, you know, it does have a big impact what our parents teach us, doesn't it? You know, I think we can all probably remember the way our parents have dealt with money and those ideas, they do, they do carry through and you do sometimes have to challenge, is that, the, is that 
what I want to do with my life. Now, Dave, you've obviously um, taken a, a different approach to your own parents and um, that's a credit to you. And I'm sure that lots of people would have parents with a similar mindset that you've explained as well. Um, now, if for you, for the people that are listening and if you're thinking, look, I don't really know where to start. I know that I probably need to do something. I'm not actually sure. Um, then what I would suggest you do is get in touch with our team. Um, send an email to hello at dpn.com.au and one of our friendly and experienced team members will you'll engage with you for a chat and just see how we can help. Now, DPN are mortgage brokers and they have a finance business that can help you with lending and um, also just education on how you need to set things up. Um, to get ahead, maybe you're looking for a deposit or for your first home or something like that. They also help people. Um, we have a property investment business that helps people get started in property as well. Um, and we have a number of other different um, areas as well, but they're the two main relevant ones here for you tonight. We are going to jump into some much um, needed answers here to some questions that some of the people have sent into us, David. So I am going to go straight to some questions. But if you are thinking, I've got a question, now is the time to jump in either to the chat section or the Q&A section and type in your question and we're going to answer them live right here with David. Um, I have a few that I've taken note of uh, that people have put in when they registered. Now, government grants, David, what do we know at the moment about information on government grants for people that are looking to get into a property at the moment? Look, the government, there's a lot of good government grants out there at the moment for first home buyers. Um, they've just released, um, again, crisis creates opportunity. There's an extra $25,000 for first home buyers. Um, so you pay no stamp duty and an extra 25,000 that can be used as part of your deposit to get in. And even with investors, if you do house and land, um, you don't have to pay stamp duty on the house component as well. So um, there are certain, um, I guess, uh, uh, qualifications to get that 25, but there's the standard $10,000 grant and no stamp duty for first time buyers. So yeah. it's get, get, get every leverage and opportunity you can yeah. <laughs> in this time. Yeah. Now, job keeper and job seeker, what, how long have they got before they run out? out? Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, they're looking at going to September, October, and I think it's a wonderful thing that the government's done. Um, it's helped support businesses and individuals. Um, we have got a wonderful country, uh, and, and it's helped underlie um, and protect our employment and will help businesses get through this time. And mm -hmm. when we have a look at it, employment might rise to 10%. So to me, there's still nine out of 10 people working, and there's still a lot of jobs out there. So it's not to always look at doom and gloom. There is opportunity. There is, there is a lot of good happening as well. And, and I'm not discounting what's happened uh, to people who've been um, affected by this. I deal with customers that, that have done this, but we take mm -hmm. stock and actually take control and see what they can do. Yep. So. Now, we've got a question here on what is the impact of COVID on property values at the moment? Yeah. Look, uh, it's, if, if you listen to the media, everything's falling apart. And I, I usually tell customers, be careful of generalisations from the media because they can only report on today. And a lot of the information it, it, these days is not research. It's not accurate. It's, 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 it's not um, actually helpful for the person. I remember going through this through the GFC. We doubled everyone's portfolios. What, what I do is really look at the real economics in the market. So um, we've got, we deal with a number of re real estate agents and managers, and we can't get enough stock at the moment. Um, we've got uh, up in the Hunter, in, in the Newcastle area, when we've got properties that are finished complete, we've got 10 applicants to rent each property. Mm -hmm. So I believe, uh, and we've got the lowest rate environment that we've had in 80 years. Mm -hmm. When people realise, and you've got nine out of 10 people employed that hold it, We've got the lowest rates, our economy is opening up, you're going to have a lot of people rush in and buy. So it's going to actually uh, stabilise or push house prices up. So there's a limited, I believe there's a limited window to actually get a really good opportunity. And this is what we saw back in the GFC when, 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 when lending rates were at 7%, we doubled everyone's portfolios because there was mm -hmm. less buyers, the opportunity to get in, 
was then. And when the rates dropped, there was a lot of people purchasing, which pushed up house prices and we got the equity and went again. So the best yeah. time to invest or the best time to go is now, it's just knowing the areas and what to yeah. do. And I think you're right, absolutely. The research is crucial because not every area is going up and you know, in the, or down, um, there are certain areas where there's opportunities, and that's where looking at the research and the numbers is really, really crucial. Um, now we're going to jump, jump to some more questions. We've got a question here: Who would you see if you wanted to invest money in the share market rather than the bank? Um, as my daughter just keeps putting her savings in the bank, yep. and um, that's a really good question. Oh, look, it's a fantastic. I, I, there's financial planners that specialise in shares. Um, I'm, I, I, I personally like property because of the power of leverage, but if you're going to do shares, go see a financial planner. We can always recommend one. Um, and, and that's right because the money in the bank, and I have a simple calculation if at the moment you're earning less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So usually if you, if I was generous and gave you 3% interest, then you've got to pay tax on that interest. So if you're on a 30% tax bracket, there's 1% already taken. And then inflation sits between 2 and 3% in Australia. So your money in the bank is actually less than tax and inflation. It's actually going down in value. The old saying money is safe in the bank is, not, it is actually incorrect. It's actually yeah. losing value over time. So you want to get an asset or an investment that's generating um, uh, more income or more value than inflation and tax. Yeah, but certainly if you would like, oh, we've got a list of dif different um, planners that we're but in our network, in our extensive network, we'd be happy to share a list of details for you to, hmm. as a starting point to help you and your daughter out. Absolutely. Um, good question. Another question here, what could be the best financing strategy for now, fixed or variable loan? What could be the current best variable rate available? And do you think the interest rate will drop further? Look, it, it's, it's specific to individuals and it's having the right loan structure. I used to teach debt reduction uh, 20 years ago and charge $4,500. Now I do it for free and draw it on a piece of paper. So it's understanding the individual client and um, the, the lending structure is very important, learning how to use offset accounts. So um, generally having the right, you can have a really cheap rate, but if you can't pay your debt down faster, it actually becomes more expensive over time. Mm -hmm. So learning to use offset accounts is important. I think rates, are, they're the all time low. And I think fixing in a, com a component is, uh, is really good because um, you know, the banks really won't get, it's the cost of money for banks. It's not what the reserve bank says. They still have to get money at a price in return to investors. So when you're getting a rate under 3%, it's fantastic. So it depends if it's owner occupied or investment. We can get, there's investment rates, interest only, three years fixed for 2.89 and we've got access to some banks where you can do a hundred percent offset against the fixed rate. It's very rare to have that. There's only mm -hmm. one, one or one, one bank that I know of that does it. What um, about owner occupier rates, Dave? You mentioned the interest, yeah. um, the investor uh, rates, but what about the owner occupier rates? Again, they're fantastic as well. Like you can get rates down in the low twos. Mm, um, so. I have to make a little confession here. Mm -hmm. I've worked at DPN for, about seven years now and in that time I'm you know I obviously love property myself but um, I have to say that David Khalil has been a wonderful help to my family and my my husband and I and I frequently go and see David and say look can I get a better deal on these uh, loans and can I what can I do and, and just the structuring and things I actually um, you know I wasn't necessarily going to share my financial details with everyone at my you know not everybody would see them obviously David but I thought oh maybe I'll, I'll look elsewhere and I did a bit of research and um, what I found was that people weren't looking at my situation holistically and when I looked and talked to David and thought look he's going to see all my private details and that's fine um, obviously we have strict privacy policies and no one else was allowed to see them <laughs> But what he was able to do is just save me an absolute mozza um, by restructuring. And actually, I don't even have um, all things in the one bank, which was something new to me, um, in order to get the best deal. And literally, I saved so much money 
Uh, and I'm actually going through a refinance right this second that I'm about to save a ton more. So it's worth checking in on that and actively and proactively looking at every so often because you'd be amazed. Um, now, I've got another question here, enough about me. That was a little bit of a diversion. Apologies for that. Um, I'm just a bit enthusiastic and passionate. <laughs> so, um, now, we've just cleared debts through strict budgeting. That's fantastic. And discipline. Well done. Feels so awesome. good. Working on a budget to include emergency fund, which is fantastic, so savings, and commence investing. What are your thoughts on personal super contributions, please? Now, remember that um, obviously super falls into the line of financial advice, so we can't really advise on that specifically. But um, perhaps, David, do you want to add comment Absolutely. Look, again, it's, it's looking at a whole strategy to just say, put money in super um, and, 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 and that's all you do. I, I look at both inside and outside super because you don't want to wait. Uh, to me, the, 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 the retirement is a myth. You work hard to get time off. What you want to do is work hard to free up your time. So you don't want to wait till retirement to be financially free. You want to be financially free earlier. So we want to look at both inside super and outside super. And yep, putting money in super is a great idea, but super doesn't have the power of leverage unless you buy property in there as well. But it's having a holistic view. It's not just putting money in super. Is Again, if you stop working today and you're not at retirement age, how are you going to survive? You know, What's the income that's going to come in? So we want to build assets outside of super as well as inside super. So yes, great, there's tax incentives, but you want to have a look at what, what you do. But if you start putting money in super, it can affect your borrowing capacity outside as well. So you want to have a look at the whole situation first before you decide if it's just putting money in super. Okay, now we've got a question here about the NDIS. And for those that aren't familiar with what that means, it's the National Disability um, Housing. Um, now, are NDIS properties good cash flow investments? Are they low risk? Mm -hmm. Look, I, I love uh, I, NDIS. We actually have got another business where we're building NDIS properties for a superannuation fund. It's actually quite complex, um, and 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 there's a lot of spruikers out there saying that uh, you get a 14, 15 percent return, and they're not guaranteeing to connect. The, so NDIS stands for National Disability Insurance Scheme. So it's helping um, people with disabilities or uh, inabilities get into housing. Um, and there's a lot, there's a long progress to get someone or tenant matching in there. It's not as easy as everyone makes out to be. And um, on a, we do it on an institution level. We've got teams. Um, it is actually very difficult to do. And you can build a house that's non-compliant and overspend in that. So um, uh, be very careful. Do your research about it. Um, uh, be careful when someone offers you 15% rental return. It's not as simple as most people think it is. Um, it, it, we have, I have a team of experts that have been doing disabled housing for a long time. Um, it's not, we don't do it for a retail model because it's too complex. There's a lot of management. There's a lot of risk because you're dealing with people's lives mm -hmm. in that sense. So, Okay. Um, it, it isn't low risk. We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, how much do I need to get started to invest in a property? Yeah. Look, the, generally, I'd say if you have 60000 as a deposit, you can do it. But there's plenty of other ways to do it as well. And this is understanding. That sounds uh, like a lot. $60,000 if you're starting for your first property. It might yeah. be even best first. Yeah. Look, usually 5%. But... I, I try to make sure we want to get the right property. We don't want to just get cheap properties. We want to get the right property that sets you up for the next property. But there's other ways we can start with zero deposit. And um, it's understanding the lending. So what I teach people is first get education and, and we can teach people what to do, then get lending. So the lending, we can do family guarantee loans. So we can leverage off, say you've got a family member, parents, or uh, that might have their house paid off and they've got some equity the bank are willing to use part of a parent's home um, and you borrow the full 100%, you might have good income um, and we can use rental income if you use it as an investment property. So it gives you the option to buy investments um, as well. 
and you've got the rental income and you can borrow 100% and get a 100% tax deduction as well without having even a deposit. It's just yeah. knowing how to get in there. And whilst it's a completely different topic, a lot of people might not realise that when you invest in property, that can be positively geared. So that means that you can receive a return um, after you've paid your expenses, interest expenses, property management rates, etc. cetera. Um, we specialise in, in positively geared property so that you're actually earning money. So if you rent vesting or if you're investing first, you might actually use that return um, to help subsidise your own rent or your own lifestyle. Um, and it, that passive income can start to build now instead of, you know, we don't have to sell the property or anything later on to, to get that passive income. Now you can start, you can start earning that. So that is great. Um, now you mentioned we covered interest rates. There was a question on interest rates before. Um, we talked a little bit about the incentives. Um, we've, we've touched on a little bit about somebody has asked property shares or super. We sort of covered that a little bit. So it's, it's kind of good to have a mix and, and you will need to speak with a planner to look at what is right for you. We're happy to put you in touch with a whole lot of people that you can check out that we have worked with over the years and find to be very, very good. Um, are there any other questions? If, they are, if there are, you can jump in now and, and, um, and type them in. But otherwise, I think we've had a very productive session and I thank everybody for listening in tonight. And sometimes I think we all just need a little bit of reassurance and a bit of motivation and um, a bit of a, a little shift and check in to see what other people are doing to get on track. And I think we've learned a, a lot tonight in just thinking about money differently. So the key takeout for me today, David, was that you know rather than just saving and spending earning money and spending it all we need to think about paying ourselves first we need to think about putting some money aside not just putting it aside but investing it in a way that's actually giving us a return and that is the the key that we need to build wealth um, and we are going to for anyone that's sitting there thinking i can't invest i can't even make ends meet it's about looking at what we have, really scrutinising that budget, scrutinising what we're spending, where our money is going. Um, and, um, you know, the good thing is, is that the, the economy is, is definitely opening up again and there will be lots of job opportunities there as well. So scrutinising that budget, getting on top of it and um, starting to think about the future and putting aside as well. So some great tips there. If you've enjoyed something tonight, um, we'd love to hear from you. Drop us an email. As I said, if you want to reach out to our team, hello at dpn.com.au. We'd love to hear your feedback and um, we'd also love to um, you know, hear your questions and we'll happily answer those as well if you've got anything you wanted to ask us offline. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank and thanks, David, for your Thank time you, tonight. And been you know what? Pleasure. These have been really good. I haven't. Heard, <laughs> hopefully, you haven't either. Although they have crept out a couple of times. Just to see. I'll lock them up. They're, they're still there. <laughs> Thank All you. good. All right. Thanks, everybody, and have a have lovely a evening.